I am just so glad to be here. My name is Alita Black, and I lobbied to have this job of introducing Madam President. But before I introduce you to a fete ya ya ya, I want to share with you why I think she's a rock star. For almost seven years, I had the joy of spending a few weeks every summer with women leaders from Kosovo or Kosovo. And they regaled me with stories and examples of the strength and the courage and the determination that they picked up from their president. And so I am profoundly grateful to be here today. I want you to think about something before I give you, you know, the brief formal academic um, introduction. I'm a recovering academic, so you have to forgive me. Um, I want you to imagine that you're taking over a new country, a country that has been ravaged by war in ways that shocked the nation so much that America belatedly intervened. It was a war defined by sexual violence and ethnic cleansing. It was a war so horrific that it redefined international human rights law goaded the UN to put teeth into Security Council Resolutions 1888 and 1325. And out of the horror of that came a new nation with leadership that was not renowned the world over, but led by remarkable women who consistently kept the faith to help mitigate the ethnic cleansing and have the courage to come forward and prosecute violators and actually get a, convention, a conviction um, in The Hague for war crimes, predominantly for atrocities committed against women. Now I want you to switch from that and think about the fourth president of this new nation, who happens to be a woman who rose from the ranks of the police department and had to help reassemble a new government that was profoundly divided by ethnic, political, and religious strife. This is Ate Fate Yayaga. Like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, there are few people in the world I admire more. And let me tell you why. During her tenure as president, she sought to strengthen new democratic institutions in ways that secured not only the support of her divided people, but a divided world who was betting that she would not succeed. She, not, she succeeded so well that in 13 and 14, they had free and fair and transparent elections. When the government deadlocked in 14, she indefatigably met with her fiercest critics, with political opponents, and with people who argued for her removal as well as her supporters to help keep the parliament open, develop new institutes of government, most especially the establishment of the Supreme, Supreme, I'm sorry, the Special Court of Kosovo. I think this is a daunting achievement. She took a new government, a deadlock government, a divided population, a population that was war scored war scarred and fearful and built a new government. In the process of that, she set up three national councils, one tied to the academy, one tied to civil society organizations, 
and another for business communities. But she is here today because of her indefatigable work to bring women to the forefront of Kosova's political, social, and economic life. In 2012, she hosted an international summit for women entitled Partnership for Change, Empowering Women. It was attended by 200 women leaders, not only from her country, but from Europe at large, Africa, and the Middle East. They provided cross-fertilizations for ideas. They had each other's back, and it led to the creation of the Pristina Principles, which affirm the rights of women to full political and economic social participation in the life of their nation. And finally, to piggyback on the conversation that we had before this started, she led the institutional efforts to reintegrate violators, violators of, I'm sorry, to integrate survivors of sexual assault back into the political and social lives of the nation. How did she do this? She created a national council for the survivors of sexual assault. And she helped create the necessary legal infrastructure and the strategy and the vision to help hold perpetrators accountable in ways that elevated women and gave them back their hope. She will be in conversation today with Alexandra or Alex Ariaga, who has a career that I covet. She um, has worked in Congress with, as a lead staffer and director for the Congressional Human Rights Caucus, or in my vocabulary, the Jim Moran Tom Lantos Commission. Um, she's worked in the White House to, as a special advisor to President Clinton to help make, to help promote trade policies throughout the Americas that foster democracy and human rights. She's worked with two of my favorite NGOs, the United Nations and Amnesty International. And last but not least, she was a leader of my most treasured part of the State Department, the Bureau, well now, a uh, full Bureau of Democracy, <laughs> Human Rights, and Law. So you are in for a marvelous treat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is uh, uh, very exciting to be here today. It's a privilege. And with that kind of background, which really is extraordinary, um, I have the honor to be able to engage in this conversation. Uh, and wanted just to say that as we look at the world, and we talk this morning and, and this afternoon about women's leadership and leadership, period. Whether you're a man or a woman, when we talk about making sure that we have the best leaders in place and what the obstacles are, frequently it may be gender. When we look around the world and we see the level of conflict that exists, uh, this, the threats to security and to peace, and the threats to economic development and gender equality, it's wonderful to be able to speak to someone who has lived through a country situation that had faced enormous obstacles that became an example for the world to change its human rights treaties and conventions so that the violence against women would be, in fact, addressed when it comes to war and then who rose from the ranks of a country that had been mired in tensions and stress that were along ethnic lines for many, many years, become the, the leader of that nation and really uh, be able to emerge as an example for the world. It's an enormous privilege, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. <laughs> thank you. So since we have such a variety of participants here today, it would be very nice to hear from you um, a little bit about your experience, first as a young woman in Kosovo, living in a country that had been mired by such uh, ethnic tensions over so many, um, not just decades, but, but centuries, um, and whether or not that affected you, how that made that experience 
helped shape your life trajectory. Well, mm -hmm. Alexandra, thank you very much. And Madam Blake, uh, thank you very much. It is my real honor and privilege to be here with you uh, today. And I want to also congratulate the organizers uh, for putting together such a wonderful uh, uh, event and uh, this forum of bringing so, much, so many of the women leaders from uh, around the world and so much potential that I had a chance since the morning of being here uh, to be able to meet with them. Uh, well, in the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, when the rest of the Europe was uh, celebrating uh, the democracy and the fall of the uh, repression and the regimes uh, in a part of the Western uh, Balkans and the part of the world uh, where I, I was uh, uh, living, uh, uh, we have actually seen the start of the uh, dark and the blood the, a new period which was starting uh, uh, for us. That time Kosovo was a part of the former uh, Yugoslavia, uh, which experienced uh, the revival of the uh, divisions that in the name of the ethnicity and the, in the name of the uh, religious uh, differences uh, has turned the neighbors into the sworn uh, enemies. And so it was a very difficult time, not only for me, but for every single citizen of the uh, uh, Kosovo or Albania that was living in Kosovo. And during the whole time of the repression, during the whole time of the Milosevic uh, uh, regime, uh, Kosovo has been stripped out, out of its uh, uh, autonomy. And we were getting more and more with the difficult times, particularly our families, particularly our parents, that they were uh, being uh, struggling to find the ways how to keep their families uh, together, how to even basically find the food from the day to day uh, for their children and their families. And so being the child of uh, one of the families of the Kosovo uh, uh, citizen and being one of the younger uh, people, I could not uh, and I had to go through and experience on everything what the country was going uh, uh, through. And for us, it was impossible not to live with the first hand what we were going through as the uh, country during that time. Uh, just because we are in the facility of this educational uh, uh, institution, I want also to point out that we, as the Kosovo Albanian people, we have been banned from the rights of also the education just because we were the Kosovo uh, Albanians. Uh, the people, our children, have been segregated by the other uh, ethnicity uh, groups uh, from the primary uh, schools, and they had uh, no right even to enter the facilities of the schools. Seeing that situation, uh, many people and many of the leaders in the country has immediately taken the leadership to establish the parallel system of the education so we could keep the country running no matter that we were facing with the enormous process of the re uh, repression uh, towards the country, where many of the families, uh, they have offered their houses uh, to be used as the uh, improvised uh, facilities for the school of our uh, students. Many and hundreds of these families, they put their life into the risk uh, by being the possible uh, uh, targets towards the, uh, the paramilitary and military forces of the Serbia uh, to be able to, for, in order to be prosecuted for what they have been uh, 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 doing and what they have been offering. And uh, for about 100,000 Kosovo students, and they have been permanently moved in 3,200 uh, houses, garages, and basements, which were turned into the improvised uh, school facilities. And no matter what we were going through that period, no matter the challenges that we were going, 
we, there was nothing that could, uh, could push back us from the process of learning. And I remember very vividly that time that uh, I, uh, myself, together with another 47 classmates, uh, we were sitting in a very small, little, tiny room in a house in the suburb of the capital city of Pristina. That, that room uh, barely had, most of the time, the doors and the windows because they were broken every time the paramilitary and military forces were coming and dragging us and putting out of these facilities because we were not allowed to be uh, there holding uh, the classes. And uh, most of the time during the winter time, the temperatures were going uh, below minus uh, 10, 20 uh, Celsius. And most of the time, even the snow and the rain was coming uh, inside. But that, well, that was nothing that was were able to push us back from our courage to move forward and to learn. We had also very limited access into the books to the Albanians because the Albanians' books were banned from the circulation. And while for many of our peers in a neighboring country or the Europe, the, uh, the routine of going to school and coming back to school, it was a normal routine actually for us and especially for our parents was the moment that they feared the mostly because we never knew it when we are going to be caught. Are we going to be beaten? Are we going to be tortured? Are we going to be prosecuted? Or are we going to be able to come back at home at the end of the uh, day? And so 18 years ago, we have inherited a country which has been totally destroyed, not only from the, hu from the infrastructure point of view, but also from the human point of view. We have inherited a country which has left behind over tens of thousands of people which have been killed and massacred. Till, still, till today's date, we have about 1,600 people missing in different massive graves within the territory of Kosovo and territory of Serbia, while Serbia still is refusing to share the statistics of the maps where these massive graves are, so for our family members to be able to find the remains of the bodies of their loved ones. And we have inherited a country which has left behind about 20,000 women, which has been raped as a tool of war during uh, the war uh, time. But I was also experienced to live in this past uh, 18 years on building a new Kosovo, being able to set up the foundation that what happened to us, we would never ever allow to happen to anybody else, not within the country, uh, in the region and globally. So the I have to admit and to share with you that when uh, the war was going on in Yugoslavia and, and Dayton Accords were happening, I was at the State Department and my boss, John Shattuck, at the time, um, was able to get some of the initial satellite photographs that then went to Secretary Albright uh, to be able to show to the United Nations that, in fact, mass graves were, could be seen. Uh, and, um, and one of the things that struck me at the time was that it really did finally shed international attention to a circumstance um, that had been going on, the violence that had been going on for so very long. Um, and this is not unique, unfortunately, to that region of the world. Again, if we look to almost every continent, we can point to conflict, and particularly where violence against women and is happening and, and rape during war as well. But in this case, it did help shed a light. And it is striking that coming out of that, that um, at the birth of this new nation, that the attitude was, let's build, yeah. uh, when it could have taken many directions. And at that time, um, if, if you could sh share with us how you came um, to go from your early childhood and, and really uh, coveting education to joining the police force and, and then rising through the ranks of what most people would think is not an area where women would necessarily be rising. So if you could tell us a little bit about that experience and why the police force of all the directions you might have gone and, um, and how you, whether or not gender was um, an obstacle at any time or how you maneuvered that. 
Um, Alessandra, thank you very much. And uh, before I answer to this, uh, I have to make another remark uh, because uh, it is because of you people that you were sitting in that time administration within the White House and within the State Department. And it is because of the leadership of the President Clinton, of the First Lady Clinton and of the Secretary Albright, that I am literally sitting and, and with you as a living human beings. Because if they were not... If they were not for us at that time, I wouldn't be here with you today because of the exact reason that I have mentioned earlier, that what we have seen happen in Kosovo, that one million people were made to leave by force the country for the, for the purpose of the ethnic cleansing. History never have seen that level of the genocide taking place in the doorstep of the European Union at the end of the 20th century. So, uh, yes, during the police uh, organization, after uh, the war has been brought to an end uh, with uh, the help of the uh, humanitarian intervention of the uh, NATO, which is uh, the first time in the history of the alliance uh, uh, which they conducted the operation for the purpose of the stopping the genocide and the ethnic cleansing which was taking place in the uh, country has opened the opportunities for uh, our freedom, but also has opened the opportunities for building our country and building our institution. And the building of the Kosovo police has been also one of the processes that has been undertaken immediately after the end of the war in uh, Kosovo. After the war, I was the graduated young lawyer, which was working for the UN office. And that time, uh, it was one of the best and the safest job that somebody was able to get immediately after the end of the war in the country. And suddenly, uh, at the end of the, uh, 1999, I decided to quit that job and join to the Kosovo uh, police. Uh, and uh, I was uh, quitting the job that was paid 20, more, uh, more, uh, 20 times more than the job that I was about uh, to take. <laughs> Uh, which many people, starting from my family and my friends, uh, thought that uh, for a second uh, it is one of my craziest ideas. But I have to tell you that they have this, uh, said they have seen also some crazy other details for me taken before that. <laughs> and uh, so, but later on they have become one of the greatest supporters on everything that I was doing and throughout my uh, career. Uh, I have done that for the two reasons. The first reason is because for entire my life I was in the search from the, uh, for the freedom and for the justice. And it was that momentum after the end of the war that I have said to myself, now is the time that I need to return back and I need to give my contribution on the country on building more safe and more secure environment towards for all of the citizens within my country. Uh, we were not only building the Kosovo police that time, but we were also building the tr as the institution that time, but we were also building the trust of the people towards the institution. The reason why I'm mentioning that is that the, uh, before the war time and during the war time, the police the, uh, was not only seen there as an organization or as in the uniform, which is supposed to be helping the people and which is supposed to be servi uh, serving for the people. It was the tool of the repression. It was the tool of state that they, uh, the uniform during the war time and uh, uh, before the war and during the repression time has been symbolizing the torture, has been symbolizing the brutality and has been symbolizing uh, the uh, prosecution towards the people. And so for us it was important that time to be able to regain the trust of the people uh, in their 
their eyes about what the uniform uh, was representing in order and we were able to do that immediately after the end of the uh, war by recruiting excellent boys and girls within the uh, police organization by offering the security uh, uh, services and the quality of services towards all the citizens regardless of their ethnicity regardless of their uh, religion and regardless of their political uh, differences and the uh, uh, backgrounds on that. As the second reason there, it is to introduce the role of the women within the police uh, organization because there were no women in the police organization uh, before the wartime and for the uh, decades. Uh, Kosovo is a very male-dominated society. It is very patriarchal uh, society, which is no different from any other country in the southeastern part of the uh, Europe, where men are uh, seen to be leading and the women are expected to follow. And uh, so for me it was important to introduce the role of the women within the police uh, organization, but not only uh, within the police organization itself, but to introduce the role of the women throughout the rank, uh, uh, starting from the patrol officer and all the way down to the, must, mu the most highest rank within the police uh, organization. And that was actually very challenging because uh, the uh, male mentality in the country was was kind of like able to accept that, okay, we probably need the women to have in the police organization, but why to hell we need them as the supervisor and as the commanders? <laughs> and so I had faced with the many of the very strange questions uh, uh, from my own colleagues that time that, well, uh, no matter what kind of the rank I was, the general or the colonel or the major, I said like, uh, well, do we really need to have that percent that you are really pushing forward. And uh, because in the beginning, from the very beginning, I have introduced, and I have been one of the greatest lobbyists of introducing the quota system, uh, which that time started with 15% of the women within Kosovo police organization uh, throughout uh, uh, the ranks. Uh, because I was very much focused on establishing the sustainable mechanisms in place, which will guarantee the sustainability of the role of the women uh, as even after the time that the people will be moving from one position uh, to another position. And it was exactly the role of the women that has contributed in increasing the level of the trust of the people towards the police organization. Kosovo police has been and continues to be one of the most trusted institutions out of all of the governmental institutions in the country since the end of the war. And I consider myself uh, to be privileged and I feel very proud that I was able to contribute towards this organization. I was a part of this uh, organization and it has followed me exactly the same principle as it did while I was in the police organization, also as the president of the Republic of Kosovo, to serving the country and serving to the people of my country. And then you moved from the police force and, um, and became president as an independent. Um, and, um, and in a situation where you really received an enormous mandate unlike anyone else had actually received previously in your election. And at the time, not only were you the first woman president of Kosovo, but also one of the youngest ever to be elected. Uh, and, and you came in with an enormous mandate and were able to effect change. So it would be, um, if you could please talk to us a little bit about uh, not only did, were you able to transform the, the police force and build that trust, but then arriving at the presidency, seeing very clearly what the mission needed to be. What were some of the primary um, issues that you felt needed to be addressed in order to move your agenda forward? You had already identified the important role of women in the police force. What was the next step? Yeah. Uh, well, Alexandra, I was elected uh, in 2011 where the country was in a very deep political uh, crisis. Uh, we just came out that time out of the two rounds of the parliamentary elections, which were that time followed by a major criticism by the international community at that level that they were uh, held. 
And the Constitutional Court at that time ruled down two former presidents uh, and uh, obliged them to the resignation uh, for the violation of the uh, Constitution. And that time we were experienced to see a very uh, polarized uh, atmosphere among all political parties uh, in the country. And that time, seeing the situation that we were facing as the country, uh, none of the candidates at that time the names that were circulating for the position of the president was able to get the uh, majority of the votes uh, to be elected as the president, as the head of the uh, state. And three main political parties in the country at that time, they came up with a proposal to nominate a consensual uh, candidate. And that's why uh, how my name came forward based into my clean background, based on the high integrity and the years served within the public uh, service. And uh, I was elected uh, in the first round of the election ever in the history of the Republic of uh, Kosovo with 80% of the uh, uh, votes. I was also elected as the very first woman president of, uh, in the history of my country, but also in this history of the southeastern part of the Europe. And uh, that time when I was elected, I cannot say it for now, uh, I was only 35 years of age, and uh, I was the youngest head of state ever to be democratically uh, elected. And so it took three men to choose a woman to come and fix the mess that they have created. <laughs> And uh, so I was uh, very conscious in the very beginning, Alessandra, that uh, what would be my major challenges and obstacles, uh, because I did not only have the constitutional obligations to fulfill as the president of the Kosovo, mm -hmm. uh, but I had also, some, and most of the time that has followed me throughout my career, I had to show maybe 3,000% more in order to be accepted up to maybe 1% by the male politicians within uh, uh, the country. No matter what I was doing, to them it sounded it is the wrong decision. It was always more of the news, what I was wearing that day, or what kind of the bags I'm having, or what kind of the shoes, then what kind of the policy exactly I was setting up or I was unfolding uh, to the job and the task that has been uh, given to me. But I was also very much conscious something that has followed me throughout my mandate, that I was not only the president of Kosovo, but I also had uh, paid a special attention that I was the first woman ever to be elected in the uh, country and also belonging to the younger generation of the leaders. So I had an added burning on my shoulder that I had to leave a legacy behind for the other women to follow and other younger generation uh, to follow for my country and the region and the uh, globally as well. Can we just so stop for a second? <laughs> And so throughout my mandate, I had uh, to, Larry, uh, to rally, and you were very much uh, uh, right when you said that I was independent. I had a no political uh, party, uh, which I belonged to, and it, which was supporting me. I had many of them, tens of them, that were, they were in daily basis against me. Uh, so I had to rally the political support on all of the, all of the policies, uh, decision, and the support that I needed, and the uh, change that I wanted wanted to make in order to fulfill my, the, my constitutional obligation as the president of Kosovo. Uh, I want to mention uh, something that has been, I have started immediately after I've taken over my office as the president of Kosovo, that has been a turning point not only on me personally, but also for the new history of my country. That is dealing with the survivors of the sexual violence during the wartime in uh, Kosovo. Uh, to uh, my surprise, one of the very first weeks being in the office, I have been uh, contacted by the one of the survivors of the sexual violence uh, within uh, one part of the country. After I met her, I met her, and I met 35 other women survivors of the sexual violence. It has uh, uh, it was a turning point uh, for me 
for my uh, uh, presidency and the way that uh, I wanted to, to use my time as the president to serve to my country and to my people. I could not believe to myself, first of all, that me as the president of that country, as the citizen of that country, I was not aware up to that level that we have about 20,000 women and men of my country that has been sexually abused, used as a tool of war in the country, that they have been left for the continuous 15 years after the end of the war under the mercy of no one. They have, it was a taboo topic. It was the topic that the people simply, in the symbol of their uh, mentality, did not uh, speak about that. And they have been majorly stigmatized by the general public by pointing the finger towards the victims and not towards the perpetrators who had done this uh, horrendous crime. It was at that moment that I said to myself, this is enough and this will never be allowed anymore in my country, under my leadership, that these survivors will continue to be the victims and to be suffering with the consequences of this horrendous crime and the war. So that time I established the National Council for the Survivors of the Sexual Violence, where I brought around the same decision-making table. Uh, the main players in, uh, in the country included the government, parliament, uh, ministries, civil society, medias, and the international community in order to uh, establish the proper system which will contribute on the reintegration, resocialization, and rehabilitation of all the victims of the sexual uh, violence. And today, as we speak, four years after of the intensive work of the National uh, Council, the survivors of the sexual violence, they do enjoy their legal status as the civilian victims of the war. Uh, we have managed also to tackle the stigma, though we still have a lot of work to do when we speak about uh, the stigma within our society toward the survivors of the sexual violence. I have been uh, their strongest voice because at the end of the uh, day, what these victims were they wanted from immediately after the end of the war was an ear that they can listen uh, to their requirement and their demands and the voice that they can speak on their behalf. And I offered my ear and my voice to be able to speak on their behalf, not only inside the country, but internationally as well. Since the end of the war, Alexandra, we don't have not even a single uh, person, not a single perpetrator which has been put forward or has been prosecuted and trialed fairly for the crimes that they have done towards the innocent citizens of Kosovo. Uh, because the bodies of those victims has been turned into the battlefield for the paramilitary and military forces of Serbia. And all of these criminals that flee and they are within the country of Serbia. And the Serbia simply does not cooperate with Kosovo uh, to hand over these perpetrators and to contribute on tackling this culture of impunity. So still for us has been and continues to remain a struggle on tackling the phenomena of the survivors of the sexual violence inside the country, but particularly in the regard of the access of the justice and bringing in front of uh, the justice whoever done this horrendous crime towards the innocent citizens of my country. So it's hard to, to go from there, and it, it is, um, I'd like to ask you a little bit, taking um, that to the next uh, level on the global stage. Yeah. Um, as we look now, I know that you have been very active in calling for Kosovo to be part of the European Union. You also um, have been very active on another global phenomenon right now, which is the attention that is being paid to issues of violent extremism. And those are two, um, two issues that are very much on the global stage. Um, and if you could comment a little bit about your work in that area, yeah. um, both in terms of why it is important to be at the table with the European Union, but also your work specifically in combating violent extremism and what you have found to be the approach that is most effective 
as a part of that, I know that in our previous conversations, you talked about the gender component of that work. Uh, and so if you could also just tell us a little bit and share with us as we are thinking about the mandate going forward, where we go from there. Yeah. Alexander, thank you very much. When we speak about the uh, EU agenda and the EU perspective, uh, Kosovo belongs historically uh, and naturally towards the European uh, Union. And the future of Kosovo, like is the future of the entire region of the southeastern part of the Europe, or as we refer, the Western Balkan, has been and continues to be within the European Union. And we have no other alternative than the EU integration. Uh, but uh, we do know that, and you have seen that the Europe has been facing with some significant uh, difficulty in this past uh, few months or the past uh, few years that somehow put in hold the enlargement uh, uh, policy towards uh, the rest of the uh, region. Uh, but now is the momentum that we have no time to lose when we speak about the EU integration. Even in the past, we have seen when the Europe European Union and the EU policy, it is not unified or it is not united when we speak or speak in, in one voice about the uh, southeastern part of the Europe, uh, the Western Balkans. Other competing agenda will come into the surface which are not necessarily in the interest of our countries individually or collectively in the entire region of the Western uh, uh, Balkans. And we do know that the process of the integration, it is an individual process, is a contractual relation between the European Union and itself, the aspiring uh, country. Uh, though the European integration process, it's a very long process. It is a process that uh, as soon as you start, take from 20 up to 25 years of the process of the integration, which starts from the reform in the public administration and all the way down to the, uh, to the fight against organized crime, corruption, and uh, uh, other reforms which are necessary for the uh, well-being and improvement the daily life of our uh, uh, citizen. Uh, but something that which has been very crucial for us during the and for all of the countries aspiring towards the EU integration, it is the good neighborhood uh, relations. And we as the region, we still have a lot of the things uh, in the question mark when we speak about our past, that we will not be able to move on the EU integration process before we solve all of the unsolved issues. That's why we as the Kosovo, we started the political dialogue uh, under the facilitation of the European Union uh, with the former foe, the Republic of the uh, Serbia. Many agreement has been reached so far in the six years of the dialogue, but we are not so much pleased with the pace of the implementation of this agreement. But one thing it is sure that Kosovo's independence is a reversible, irreversible process. It is a red line and the, uh, the issue of the borders and redrafting the borders in that part of the Europe, it is a closed chapter and that closed chapter has been done back in 1999 after the end of the war in Kosovo. Uh, so, on the regard of the uh, extremism, on the violent extremism and the foreign fighters, well, Alexandra, neither Kosovo, neither US, neither any country, being a small or being big, uh, can be immune towards this uh, negative uh, phenomena that we are facing. Uh, we, as a country, we have been very effective on tackling uh, this threat, which was posing a threat not only to our democracy, uh, uh, but also to the daily life of our citizens when we deal with the violent extremism and the foreign fighters. Uh, but this fight has to be seen from uh, three levels or in the three uh, phases. First of all, for us, it was imp important to, uh, to see it from the ground, actually what was happening, who were the foreign fighters, uh, what was the reason that they became uh, violent, what was the drive that was moving them towards the uh, radicalization, and also for us it was important and it is always very much important to remove the myths particularly of making the clear uh, uh, line of the dividing between uh, the religion and between the terrorism and especially removing the continuous stigma that relies among the Muslim uh, community as a first. As a second it was for, uh, very much important for us to contribute on the increase in the partnership and the cooperation and the collaboration 
collaboration, first of all with our neighboring countries, then with the European Union, and then with the United uh, States. And as a result of the regional cooperation, we have uh, several people which have been arrested for the support of the regional uh, uh, recruitment and incitement of the uh, mm -hmm. foreign fighters. Uh, then Kosovo being uh, one of the very first countries in the region, part of the global coalition in fact, against the fight on the fight against the ISIS. Mm -hmm. We have arrested tens of the uh, Kosovar citizens, uh, which has uh, been uh, uh, going towards uh, Iraq or Syria as a part of the ISIS, Al Nusra, and other uh, uh, organizations. Then we have shut down the illegal mosque. We have shut down the uh, NGOs, which has operated as the front organization for the recruitment and incitement of the Kosovar citizens. But Kosovo has never been a cell of the ISIS. Usually, the recruitment has been done, and we have started to have this problem in 2014. But back in 2016, we totally eliminated this global challenge that was facing in Kosovo. And mainly, this recruitment has taken place uh, by the individuals which has uh, the uh, they supported the ideas of the uh, of the uh, ISIS uh, uh, individuals uh, within the uh, country. And so, uh, for that, what I said, second step, third step, and the most important that sometimes we, uh, as the especially institutions, they don't pay attention in the very beginning is that they think that after the rule of law, after the uh, security mechanism take place, uh, that has been actually finished. No, actually, it is another start because it is about follow up. What you do with the foreign fighters, which are in the process of the prosecution, what you do when, uh, for example, you have the foreign fighters returning to the country and you don't have the enough evidences to prosecute uh, uh, them. And so how you are going to reintegrate and resocialize them within the country. And we should never forget that they are the citizens of your own country and they have to be treated fairly and equally uh, like all other citizens throughout the, pr uh, the process because uh, no matter what has happened, they are the citizens of your own uh, country. And in your kind, uh, question, it is, if is, there, uh, is it their agenda? element. Absolutely that there is a gender element uh, into that because there are different uh, uh, criteria, even starting from the recruitment process mm -hmm. uh, uh, which targets the women and which targets uh, the men as well. And so the strategist has to be carefully thought and carefully managed uh, from the very beginning, which has to be gender oriented uh, from the very beginning. And we, most of the time we do forget and we have tendency on forgetting uh, that in most of the war zones, uh, when the foreign fighters ghost they bring together women and children and what you do with them when they return to the country and how you are going to reintegrate so the gender element on the effective fight against the uh, violent extremism and the foreign fighter it is very important Great. thank you so much before we close and I know we do need to close I just wanted to give you the last word if there's anything that you wanted to say to those participants who are here today who are interested in these topics and about the value of having this kind of a forum as they go forward? Well, something that I always say to the young people, to the young women and young men, it is that uh, you should always believe in yourself, believe in your potential, always aim high and dream high, and don't you never ever make a compromise with your principles and for what you stand for because I never done that. And it brought to me where I am now. Madam President, thank you so much. Thank you.